in this time of epiphany, we will not keep silent. We will not rest. Our witness shines like a new dawn. Light a path for us, O oh God, that we may move into new relationships. We have been called by you into new ways of being. Your torch has been passed to us. In you, our light has come. We are not forsaken. We are not desolate. In you, God, we find our delight. Let glory be on our lips as we delight in your presence. Inspire us, God, as we worship together. I am dwelling on the mountain where the golden sunlight gleams or a land whose wondrous beauty far exceeds my fondest dreams where the air is pure ethereal laden with the breath of flowers they are blooming by the fountain neath the shelter of the bowers is not this the land of beulah blessed blessed land of light where the flowers bloom forever and the sun is always bright tell me not of heavy crosses nor of burdens hard to bear for i found this great salvation makes each burden light appear and i love to follow jesus while discounting every loss worldly honors all forsaking for the glory of the cross is not this the land of beulah blessed blessed land of light where the flowers bloom forever and the sun is always bright welcome to online worship at birchcliff bluffs united church uh, we're back in this format as we work along with our neighbors and our community to keep each other safe during this time if you have needs that are not being met please contact the church office and we will work to support you we have a variety of ways that you can connect online including a new possibility on tuesday afternoons bring your crafts bring a cup of tea or coffee or wine and share in online time together if you would like more information about this uh, check your church buzz weekly buzz or contact the church office this of course is in addition to other offerings including the re-engagement of our popular after church connection each sunday at 11 30 a.m on zoom where we discuss the service and the theme of the day and i want you to remember that whoever you are wherever you come from however you identify you're welcome here at Birchcliff Bluffs United Church. As we come to this time of worship, we take time to acknowledge this sacred land. We gather here, it has been a site of human activity for many thousands of years. It is the home of the Huron Wendat, the Patun First Nations, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit and the Scugog lands are part of the Williams Treaty, and I encourage you to investigate where you live, to understand the care of the land that has been done for thousands of years by Indigenous people. And the land we now call Toronto remains home to many people from across Turtle Island, the ancient name for these lands, and we're grateful for the opportunity to live and to work on this territory. 
part of the work that we need to do is the work of reconciliation, seeking to be mindful of broken covenants and the need to strive to make right with all our relations. May we remember through this candle that in bringing the light, Jesus turned water into wine, turned our tedium into festival, and showed us how to engage both our commitment and the excitement of celebrations. May we find strength in the journey and joy in the struggle through the grace God offers in the light of Jesus. Justice showing us what love must do. Listen to the voice of wisdom crying in the marketplace. Hear the word made flesh among us, full of glory, truth, and grace. When the ripens peace and righteousness embrace sister wisdom come assist us nurture all who seek rebirth spirit guide and close companion bring to light our sacred worth free us to Let's share together in prayer. With open minds and open hearts, we come before you, God. Open us to the tremendous news around us, the birth of Jesus, the story of the wise ones, Jesus' baptism, news so incredible that it cannot be contained. We bring together all our resources, all that we are and all that we have to share the good news. We're called to be more. We are called to be a community of faith here in this place. Be with us now as we discern your call to us, as we discern how to follow you. Amen. We are given so many gifts in our lives, unique to each one of us. And how we use the gifts that are offered uh, sometimes comes easy, sometimes it requires work. Communication is central to how we support each other and make meaning with each other. The online world has changed how we communicate with each other. We are experiencing that now, but there are so many little touchstones that uh, remind me of the importance of communicating. I was thinking of uh, how we write Christmas cards and that important link that the things we say in written form can have great impact. And it's different than communicating with each other face to face. Zoom, similarly, requires each of us to read people differently, and it requires us to think a little bit more when we speak, because it can be a challenge to read people's body language remotely. And so the gift of intuition, the gift of knowing what to say and when to say it and how to say it is a, a growing, important gift for us 
in this time of remote communication. And while God offers these gifts to us as well, God calls us to think about how we use them. Certainly those of you who are engaging social media know how these gifts can be misused and twisted in ways that suit our own purposes instead of the greater good. And so for something completely different today, I offer this prayer. God, when we take the time to see and use and understand the incredible gifts that you have shared with us, we're in awe. And at the same time, we also realize how we have misused the gifts of your spirit. When life is happening so fast, we act and we speak before we think. We've caused harm by our off-the-cuff remarks, and we have failed to forgive ourselves and each other. Our actions have led to exclusion and division. Knowingly and unknowingly, we have caused harm. Forgive us our mistakes, forgive our ignorance, and forgive our hastiness. Amen. God watches, God listens to us, God responds out of conditional love. Allow the spirit to embrace you and know that you are forgiven. And for something completely different today, take a moment to consider how we have hurt each other and ponder these words of forgiveness. There is no east or west, in him no south or north, but one great family of love throughout the whole wide earth. In him shall true hearts everywhere their high communion find. His service is the golden cord, close binding humankind. Join hands then, people of the faith, whate'er your race may be. All children of the living God are surely kin to me. In Christ now meet both east and west, in him meet south and north. All Christ-like souls are one in him throughout the whole wide earth. Let us pray together as we listen to God's word. The scriptures proclaim to us the message of your light. Loving and ever-present God, shine your light on us so that we may discover and live a path that follows you. Amen. Our first reading is from Paul's first letter to the people of Corinth about spiritual gifts. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same spirit, and there are varieties of services but the same God. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who activates all of them in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit, to another, gifts of healing by the, the one Spirit, to another, the working of miracles, to another, prophecy, to another, the discernment of spirits, to another, various kinds of tongues, to another, the interpretation of tongues. 
all these are activated by one and the same spirit who allots to each one individually just as the spirit chooses. Our gospel reading shares a story from the beginning of Jesus's ministry as he begins to understand his role in sharing the good news. Taken from the book of John, the wedding at Cana reminds us of Jesus's unique way of engaging people. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what concern is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Standing there were six stone water jars for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding twenty or thirty gallons. Jesus said to them, Fill the water jars with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, Now draw some out and take it to the chief steward. So they took it. When the steward tasted the water that had become wine and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the steward called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk. But you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this, the first of his signs, in Cana of Galilee, and revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. These are the stories of Jesus for us to consider in our lives today. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together. God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our heart cause us to be stirred by your spirit. In the hearing of stories, may we respond in ways that help us to fulfill your gifts, the gifts of life that we are called to offer to each other. Amen. So they thought that nothing had been left to chance at the wedding in our gospel reading. It's a very proper arranged marriage. And the whole village of Cana is invited. The problem is, of course, that the whole village actually comes, whether they are RSVP'd or not. And so the wine starts to run out on the third day of the festivities. But somehow, the problem is solved and the family's honor is preserved and everyone goes home happy and maybe a bit tipsy. But <laughs> the funny thing is, of course, afterwards, nobody can remember who actually got married at the party. That, however, doesn't really matter. Most church people know the story of the wedding at Cana because that's when Jesus turns water into wine. And unless you're really an old school Methodist, uh, biblical encouragement to drink wine is usually pretty popular. We have two photos here. They show two types of containers that were popular, or I'll say common, in first century Palestine. Above are uh, several pottery jars called amphorae, and they were for holding wine. And at the bottom, we have large stone containers that were able to hold water. And in Jesus' day, issues of ceremonial purity were reaching fever pitch. You need to know that in that time, many things could cause pollution. 
touching corpse, blood, uh, other bodily fluids, eating Gentile foods. So you need to know that only water in the stone containers shown below remained pure for washing. Wine was not ceremonially pure and is stored in these impure ceramic amphorae. And never the twain shall meet. They were not to be mixed up. So that's a bit of the context for our story, because by the time the wine runs out, there are many empty amphorae lying around. And so the big question is, why doesn't Jesus just ask the stewards to fill them with water rather than the stone jars, which were used for the Jewish rites of purification? Jesus must have been aware that contaminating the water jars would have been a huge breach of Jewish law. And the author of the story stresses that the steward in charge does not know where the new batch of wine is coming from. Only Jesus and the others who are in the back room get to have a little chuckle over their secret. Something else must have been happening or else it's just a hole in the story, something unexplained or unusual. So I asked the question, what's going on here? <clears throat> well, it's, I'm going to drink some water. <clears throat> it suggests to me that Jesus, as part of his entry onto the ministerial stage, is specifically and deliberately challenging purity laws of the day, and ushering in a new age of abundance. Think about how that might play out in our own church today. Let's say there was an announcement in the buzz next week that for the entire months of May and June, church is canceled. Instead, everyone is to come on Sunday morning and plant a huge garden that's going to grow food for the Bluffs Food Bank. Well, of course, the fourth commandment's out the window, prohibiting work on the Sabbath in favor of some heavy digging and tilling by us for the benefit of others. As we consider the role of this place, the work of Birchcliffe Bluffs United Church, the physical building, and what it represents in our community, we might be shaking things up a little bit. How will these things be received? Now, I know that we all have the best intentions and things might sound good. We might want to do all of these things, but when it comes right down to actually doing it, we might grumble a little bit. Change is hard. But there's other things happening here as well in our story. Now, the story we hear today is from the book of John. And in the sequence of events in the book of John, this story comes immediately after what we heard last week, Jesus' baptism. That's last week's story. So when we pick this story up in John, the first Three words of the reading are three days later. Perhaps nothing, but given how deliberate John is in writing, carefully chosen poetic wording where everything's intended to pack a Christological punch. If we don't think it means something, I think that might be another hole in our story. So, <clears throat> Three days later. <laughs> there are places in the Bible where we often hear about these three days later ideas. Think about them for yourself. I'll give you a few. Joseph in Egypt, sending his brother away three times, once each day. 
Peter's denial three times, and then the roast, rooster crowing three times. Moses going up Mount Sinai, and then coming down three days later with the commandments. Even the death and resurrection of Jesus has a three-day interval associated with it. Interestingly, or perhaps revealing in the context of this story, the time frame for purification rituals like those of contaminated water were also three-day intervals. Hmm. Perhaps the third day is more symbolic than simply chronological. Maybe it's looking forward to Jesus' resurrection on the third day, but we should also look back to the scriptures that the writer would have been familiar with. Remember, I put Moses in the mix a few seconds ago. This third day idea is critical. It comes at a crucial juncture in Israel's history. It comes at the giving of the law in Exodus. And as the Hebrew people arrived at Mount Sinai in the desert, Yahweh tells Moses to consecrate the people by having them wash their clothes today and tomorrow, because on the third day, Yahweh will come down upon Mount Sinai in the sight of the people. The three days is a motif that's used repeatedly. In fact, uh, it happens four times through the Exodus narrative when you read it. John's gospel, as you can discover from a thorough read, shows through symbol and story what we read in Matthew and Luke more as plain language. Instead of Moses in the ancient stories, what we have here today is Yahweh's son. Come down in the sight of all the people to introduce a new age where God's humanity trumps the rigid application of law. Jesus is the new Moses, the new leader of the people. But wait, there's more. When you read this story, what are your thoughts about Mary and Jesus, about their relationship? And if you think that this is just there for the sake of good drama, Remember, I've told you, John is quite intentional. Think again. A simple reading would leave us with another hole in the story. In a time where women are expected to take a back seat, to acquiesce to the power and authority of the patriarchy, the gospel writer turns this notion on its head. It counters typical period gender exclusion by placing Jesus' own mother at the center of this story. She's apparently the first to find out from the stewards that the wine's run out. Now, much has been written about this exchange between Jesus and his mother, but whenever I've researched this, uh, never before had I read a rather obvious interpretation that several feminist theologians offer. Here, Jesus' mother understands him better than he understands himself. She doesn't argue with his objection that this isn't my time. She just tells the stewards to, you know, whatever he tells you to do, do it. Well, Jesus does, and they do. So let's give a cheer for Mary, because really she's a take charge mom here, isn't she? Mary's statement implies that she totally believes that Jesus can do something about this situation. Her approach emphasizes the importance of Jesus' authority. And whatever it is that Jesus might possibly say at this moment, she says this, you know, do as he says, follow his lead. And with these in explicit instructions, Mary very diplomatically places the situation into Jesus' hands. And like every conscientious mother of a young adult, Mary recognizes the importance of allowing her child to make their own decisions. 
but she sets the stage in order to facilitate both his response and as well to communicate to her own child that she has faith in him. Jesus initiates this ministry himself, but it's clear that his mother was involved in the instigation. Many people came to believe in Jesus as the Messiah because of this sign at Cana. And Mary can be credited unilaterally with making the preparations for this sign to occur. Acknowledging the crucial role that Mary plays here fills in another hole in the story. It provides a model of strength, of perseverance, and unwavering faith for all validating an often overlooked reality that biblical women were both followers and leaders in the early church. Mary becomes the first woman in a series of people in the gospel narrative who intuit spiritual truth better than their male counterparts. Just wait till we read the Easter story. John's a good read for revealing that. The gospel writer ends the story with a very full summary. There's no more holes here, right? The act in Cana of Galilee was the first sign Jesus gave, the first glimpse of his glory, and his disciples believed in him. I like the word signs. John never calls unusual events miracles. They're signs. In today's lexicon, a, a sign still means something, something that can be interpreted in a number of ways. Stop signs, a warning, perhaps a trail marker, it could be instructions. And I wonder if that understanding gives us another way to consider miracles. Is it possible to see these types of signs and miss what they signify? Because of all the signs that Jesus performed, healing and raising from the dead. The first that we hear about in this gospel is turning water into wine. Why is that? Maybe we still have actually one last hole that needs to be explored. There is, of course, a part of our own sensibilities that struggle with the story, with it being a miracle. In our 21st century world, it would be easy for us to simply set aside this ancient myth. And I look at this picture, this photo taken by Daphne Hunt along the bluffs, the miracle of color in a drab winter. I am often amazed by people's photography, the miracles that are recorded. Up to this point in our story, we've focused on the sign of this story as the start of Jesus' ministry. Yes, water becoming wine, but if this is our only focus, have we filled in all the holes in the story? There's something that we have not discussed about the water jugs that were sitting there. It's something pretty basic about them that Jesus recognized when he saw them. The whole story is about this. At the beginning of the story, the jugs are empty. They were not full of water, simply waiting for Jesus to turn the water into something else. There's nothing in the jugs. They're dry and they're parched. And if we place ourselves in this story, where would we be? Have you ever thought of yourself as one of those water jugs? Have you ever been dry or parched? Have you needed to be filled with something? What if each one of us is an empty water jug? Maybe not always, but at some point in our life, when we faced a significant obstacle, a relationship breakup, or the loss of a loved one, maybe being laid off from work, maybe 
a church financial crisis, maybe an overwhelmed or exhausted volunteer. Insert the crisis of your choice here. We spend our lives trying to fill our own jars with careers, with possessions, with stuff, but it's always our own plain old water. This story reveals that there's someone who can fill those empty jars with something way more than water, something tremendous, something rich. And the reading we heard from Corinthians today helps us to understand what this might look like. The wine analogy still applies. If each of us is an empty jar to be filled, each of us is ready to be filled with gifts, various expressions of God in action. And I like the words in this reading. Each person is given something that is activated by God. Each of us is part of something bigger than ourselves, something that God manifests in us for the common good. We hear much about the common good in these times. Our actions, the use of our gifts, is not just about ourselves, but the world around us. We control how we use our gifts, how they manifest in the world. And when we use them at their best, they can be so very good. As we think about this in the context of the gospel story, here the stewards with the empty jugs and Jesus responding. Jesus supplies these real expressions in a way that's better than even the best that had gone before. Not just water in our jugs, not even a decent $14 Cabernet Sauvignon from Pelee Island. Jesus supplies the very best. Maybe it's a special select late harvest Riesling or a stunning Niagara ice wine. That's you, whatever you are. Jesus supplies it with abundance. Do you find that surprising? Of course, you're not the only one. Everyone at Cana was astounded. What? You saved the best wine for the last? Nobody does that. Yes, Jesus does that. Yes, Jesus can fill us with the very best. No holes in Jesus' wine jugs. Jesus can fill emptiness with new life miraculously creating us anew, filling us with the best provisions around, those gifts that Paul references in Corinthians. Each of us is filled with the particular provision that we need to be the very best that we can be. What did Paul say to the Corinthians about the provisions, about these gifts? Maybe your wise counsel. Maybe your simple trust, maybe your proclamation. These provisions are handed out one by one by the Spirit of God, who is Jesus' representative here with us. So that same Jesus is still at work today. Each of us infused with the Spirit, that same Spirit that descended at the baptism last week. Water into wine unbelief into belief, empty into full, death into life, indifference into love. Jesus, the word made flesh, that change agent that surprises us by recreating creation in a new way. So there's no more holes in this story. We are the new wine and we're abundantly full. And now is the time to drink that up. Amen. Jesus, come for we invite you. Get
best and Savior, friend and God. Now as once at Cana's wedding, speak and let us hear your word. Lead us through our need or doubting, hope be born and joy restored. Jesus, come transform our pleasures, guide us into paths unknown. Bring your gifts, command your servants, let us trust in you alone. Though your hand may work in secret, all shall see what you have done. Jesus, come in new creation, heaven brought near by power divine. Give your unexpected glory, changing water into wine. Rouse the faith of your disciples, come our first and greatest sign. Jesus, come surprise our senses, make us willing to receive more than we yet imagine all the best you have to give. Let us find your hidden riches, taste your love, believe, and live. As we consider the gifts of the Spirit, we take time to consider how we offer them back to the world. And there are many ways that we can offer our gifts to this faith community and to people in our lives. Consider your own gifts. Be intentional this week to find a way to use them. Our time, our talents, the work of our hands, each piece works to change the world around us. And we know there are many ways to give. Please check out our website www.bbuc.ca slash donate to learn how you can support the work of this place in this community today and into the future. Let's pray together. Wondrous God, who continues to share with us the gifts of the Spirit, help us to accept these gifts and use them in your world. Where wisdom is offered, enable us to hear it. Your wisdom is sometimes discerned through unexpected people in unexpected places. Let wisdom speak on behalf of those struggling to find a voice or those whose voices have been stifled in the cacophony of jargon and rhetoric of our new communications in this world. Let wisdom burst forth. May it shout your truth in chaotic times. May the gift of knowledge continue to guide us as we move through our days. Let it inform and challenge us to discover new approaches to feeding God's people. May foodstuffs move from being hoarded by a few to being shared equally. May all people in our community be offered nourishment for their bodies and nourishment for their living without regard for who they are or where they come from. Let knowledge be shared through advocacy. Help us to confront barriers that hurt and oppress. May everyone receive what they need, a living wage, enabling a sense of dignity and of pride. And while this coronavirus pandemic is still in our midst, we offer prayers for the gift of healing. May those trained in a host of specialties use their skills to heal where possible, to offer hope where needed, to offer peace freely, to offer comfort for the dying. We give thanks for those who work with people living on the street offering supports for shelter, for medical supports, for safe needle exchange. May healing of the mind be as important as healing of the body. 
Thank you, God, that we continue to learn and to develop new ways to offer healing. We pray for the gift of prophecy, God. Listening to the prophets of old, we learn about you. We work to find ways to live their message in our time. We learn about your commitment to humanity. We learn of your unconditional love, freely offered to all. Through the prophetic words of Jesus, we hear about the kind of community that you call us to make together. Help us, God, to find our own prophetic voice. Empower us to speak out when we see injustice, when we witness oppression, in any place where inequality continues. Guide us, God, as we use our voice to share your story in our time and context. And we pray for those in our community and in our world who need to know your presence in their lives right now. And so we name them aloud or in silence. And we pray these things in the name of Jesus who taught us to share these words together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. us into fullness, touch us with your grace, Jesus in your mercy, draw us to your face, love us into fullness, hold us in your care, cheer us with your presence, here and everywhere. Love us into fullness, and we will be strong. Jesus, walk beside us, fill our hearts with song. Love us into fullness, touch us with your grace. Jesus, in your mercy, draw us to your face. Each day, we are blessed by God's gifts. Enable us to use them wisely, sharing them with generous hearts. We are called to be light in our world. So let us share the light that never goes out. And may the gifts of the Creator, the light of the Redeemer, and the support of the Spirit be with you today and always. Amen. <laughs>